and welcome to season five of the Professional Insight Podcast uh, on the Dean Blundell Network. Uh, my name is Brandon Curry. I'm Jeff or- Collins. I'm Josh Vaughn. And Trevor Lindy. And there's. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for Season 5. This is pretty bloody cool, ladies and gentlemen. We were pretty pumped. Uh, If you follow us on LinkedIn or wherever other places on the social media platform, which I don't even know how to work. Spotify. Yeah, or Apple TV or something like that, Uh, Google Podcasts. Um, Thank you very much, Season 5. We've just joined. This is amazing. This is is so cool, guys. Uh, The Dean Blundell... Uh, podcast network, uh, the largest podcast network in Canada. Um, yeah, they, uh, for whatever reason, they liked our stuff and we don't know why. What? We don't know why. <laughs> do you? I mean, I'm pretty pumped. And uh, we got, we do actually have a special guest actually for um, our first episode on the uh, Dean Blundell um, podcast. <laughs> and that is Dean Blundell. Is this on? <laughs> How do you do this? Is this on? Are we going? Hi, Jeff. Hi, Brandon. Hi, Josh. Hi, Trevor. Uh, Is this on? Test. Test. We got a rookie, we got a rookie here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice yeah. Nice to see you guys. Uh, if for everybody listening in the audio version of your podcast, by the way, welcome to the network. Really happy to have uh, professional insight here with us because uh, what we like to do is we like to talk to people who are way fucking smarter than us about things we know <laughs> nothing about. And you guys know a whole bunch of shit about different things that are really important to people in 2022. So welcome and thank you guys for coming, Jeff, Josh, Trevor, Brandon. Um, And uh, the other thing is, and I do want to say this, you will never find a better use of hair gel in any podcast. Congratulations to all of you. Way to go. Thank you. You look really good. (laughs) All four of you have excellent hair. Is it, is it a professional? Is that like part of the deal? Because I don't know many guys that like, you're all very professional individuals, well-educated for the most part. You've got great gigs, great careers. You guys have this, like this gap filled in your personal life where you can come and share professional insight with other people. But as part of that insight, listen, get a great gel. We met at the same barber, same barber. That's how we all met. It's actually a weird story. (laughs) Are you serious? Is that where you guys met? Y'all met at the same hair place? (laughs) Hair support Looks like it, though. Looks like it, though. Uh, No, dude, guys, it's so happy to have you here and uh, really happy to be part of your podcast and happy to have your podcast part of us. And I was fucking shocked. Sorry, are we allowed to swear in this podcast? Yes, you can. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I was shocked because um, I found out you guys did. I was talking to Chris before he joined the network. He goes, it's season five for these guys. Can you come on the season five thing? And I went back and listened to your podcast. And I'm like holy fuck, these guys are really good at this. Like, they've got a great rapport. Uh, You guys cover a whole bunch of different bases, shit that really matters to people. Like, I'm excited for your podcast because I want to know if anybody under the age of 60 that doesn't have $20 in the bank will ever be able to afford a house in this market again. Mm. Stuff like that. Shit that's important to people. So I appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. We are... We're so humbled uh, that that you asked and and you you sought us out and I mean Dean I mean we've we've known each other known of each other like we met about ten years ago something like that did we where so, remind me where were we, a were we wasted and yes. b was it okay good uh huh so let's yeah. go from there where were we where were we wasted together we were in Burlington okay uh, during one of remember my old life way way back was uh, Diageo yeah that's right Captain Morgan spiced and yeah you then, bet uh, we did a whole big big promotion combined with you and then uh yeah we we went to a couple leaf games i know because back back in the day it was it was great yeah 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 it's funny because i I look at you now and i'm like oh my god i get these glimpses or i'm like now i'm piecing it together through the drunken haze of my 30s and early 40s right now (laughs) i'm kind of getting it together where you're like yeah but we did these captain morgan things with you and it was they're incredibly fucking successful it was uh we did these q a's right and i think it was one of your brainchilds like uh, you'd worked for Diageo, which is a distribution company for a long period of time. And I remember you coming into the boardroom, big glass boardroom, sitting down with a bunch of stuff. Uh, and you remember the sales guy there? His name was Chris Van Allen. Do you remember him? Well, he was vaguely, he was but, yeah. one bad sleep away from full <laughs> full mental handicap. One bad sleep. Uh, but anyway, so he got he got this thing together and we would do these Q&As with you guys at Diageo and Captain Morgan. 
And uh, it was fucking wild because like we would operate in the silo and you were saying, dude, people are going to come and watch this thing. We'd love to partner with you on it. I'm like, really? To drink rum and listen to us talk? Like, is that going to be a thing? And we, you have like thousands of people waiting outside to get into I this I remember thing. pulling up to the Burlington, the one that was in Burlington, I forget the bar. And I remember yeah. pulling up and driving up from Niagara and the lineup was around the bloody built like to get into yeah. the place it was yeah. it was insane it was yeah. insane yeah and and when you're like when you're me when, and i just don't pay attention to shit i'm that guy that just kind of go barrels along in life and thinks that oh no one no one's listening to me so just keep going doesn't matter right and then you show up and on the radio you'd work in a silo you would just work with these three four guys you did and so when we went there that was a massive eye opener for me like oh my god people like actually listen to this radio program but it was great we had a blast by God, did I get drunk at those things too? It was incredible. It, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. It was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for um, coming on and 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 helping us on our first podcast. It was so, it's so great um, uh, to 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 hear you. But yeah, it, it, we have a lot of topics to to cover today. And um, you you had a couple questions for us, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, we had. Yeah. Yeah. Like, ahead. okay. So, cause this is what I want everybody to know. Professional insight. You guys offer professional insight in each individual discipline. Like I want to start with Josh because he's been sitting there. Hasn't said a word this whole time. I kind of feel sorry for him. Uh, so we'll go over to Josh. Josh, you're a lawyer. Like, what do you add to the equation here when you guys sit and shoot the shit about professional insight into certain industry? Yeah. It's billing, billing, billing. <laughs> <laughs> you're a lot guy. Uh, How to bill every six minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I obviously provide a lot of the uh, legal background to our discussions. Uh, my career stemmed from Northern Ontario, South Porcupine, Timmins, um, and brought me down here uh, almost 20 years now, uh, predominantly in the corporate and real estate world. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times um, that covers a wide breadth of uh, topics. So, uh, like to shoot the shit about the law. You like to shoot the shit about the law and the law where it matters and people put their lives into action. Jeff, that's kind of what you're here for, too. It's not just about the law, right? Like you cover real estate. Uh, I think you're getting into building. I mean, this is life practical for you. What do you add to the actual insight of the podcast as well? Well, I've been a, a real estate agent for residential for the last 18 years. I've been building for the last five years and now I'm dabbling in developing. So I'm, we're trying to make subdivisions and find land for people to build on in a crazy time right now of, of real estate so yeah that's my expertise okay so so as an expert in in real estate at uh what decade should we plan on being able to afford a home there's a quick question for you next decade the decade after that. in the early 2000s would be affordable so no problem <laughs> but here's Buying a question a I, early right years yeah. ago yeah your well, kids. that's the thing. You see so many people that got into houses. Like I was talking to a friend of mine who bought a condo and it was north of the city. And he said, we just cannot buy a piece of land anymore. Right. So being able to talk about, you know, where people are buying, whether or not real estate prices are coming down, inflation, interest rates, all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's real world. Right. Trevor, you're in the same industry. Is that correct? You're yeah. a mortgage broker slash hoping to get into building. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the, the mortgage broker of the group. So everything uh mortgages i'm with neighborhood dominion lending centers based in new market uh, well actually we're based in barry now is where our head office is um but i bring the the numbers to the table from uh from the borrowing side of things you get mm. the money yep yes you're the money the guy money. you you're the guy that goes and chases the money on behalf of this group yeah sure we'll we'll say that <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Okay. So, and, uh, Brandon's a financial guy, right? Like that's, you know, being able to set up these conversations, obviously super important. Brandon, you're not just, uh, you know, you, you surrounded yourself with guys in this industry, but these are obviously friend of yours. Uh, but when you say you're a financial guy, what does that mean? Where do you work? What is your background? So we, we have, um, we have our own firm. So the firm is, uh, called CR Smith financial. It's been around since 1974. I am a partner of uh, one of three who is buying out a principal right now um, down in Niagara, but we're licensed in BC, uh, Ontario, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland. And uh, I'm a certified financial planner. I'm a chartered life underwriter and I'm a certified health insurance specialist. Um, and so our firm is a broker in the wealth space, in the group benefit space, but then also in, uh, we do full blown financial plans and then insurance as well. Um, if there's a need. 
So yeah, so it's been pretty good. So we're, uh, our firm is approaching 50 years in, in business, uh, oh, wow. third, three generations. So, wow, that's awesome. So, so your goal here with professional insight is to be able to walk people through certain things that are happening, whether or not it's just in real estate, are you guys covering financial planning, life insurance, like the whole gamut? Is that what you're talking about? Just the, the professional insight from your individual disciplines, correct? Everything. We give marriage support. That'll go well. And let's also say, too, we bring guests on. So if it's a yes. topic that we can't cover, or we don't have the expertise in, yeah. we bring guests into the equation and, uh, yeah, go from there. Be able to answer as many questions for, for people as possible. Yeah, I'll tell you what, yeah, you, we, you add the life marriage counseling into the mix. You guys got a full service operation here. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So no, we, uh, we, we try to, to, so if any, any of the listeners want to have a, a, a question, it doesn't matter what that question is. If we can't answer it, mm -hmm. then we will find a professional to come on to speak about it. So, and we like to ad lib. So if someone types a question in, in the chat box here, Oh, thanks for uh, shooting a uh, shout out to Brenton Wayne yep. Donnelly for saying hello. Welcome um, but, fellas. But I don't know how to answer you on it, but I'll just verbally say hello. Welcome. Um, but, uh, yeah. So if you have a question, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if you have, if you have a question, <laughs> let us know and, and we that's can a go private there. Joke, yeah. Yeah. No. yeah no, well, yeah, that's just, the I, it's I'm, a private do, chat. Nobody do you want me to repeat what's on the, yeah, so here's the thing. Absolutely. Here's the thing. I'm like, uh, I'm like the Ron Burgundy of podcasters, right? Anything you say <laughs> and you put in the private chat, I will read. That's fine, uh, buddy. so one of the things here, and, uh, just to recap, how about shitting in an RV expertise? Uh, that's a great point. A lot of people, you know, it's like the powder room conversation, right? Do you, or do you not take a dump in an RV? Yes or no. My, my, my solution to that is absolutely if it's your RV, but nobody else can. So there oh, we go. So then you, I like yeah. that answer. That's, that's an improved answer. Why did you guys cover this recently? <laughs> this is an it's ongoing an joke ongoing about joke. Trevor's RV. Yeah. So I, you know, we bought a, a family RV a few years back yeah. and it was one of those that a rule I made, okay, I'm the one that's stuck cleaning this stuff up. So no shitting in the RV. You can use the public facilities. COVID happens. So rather than us, you know, we're still camping in 2020 and we started using it, but yeah, nobody else does. But no, how did it come up that you just told us no shit in the RV? We never go to your RV, so we wouldn't know that. So you wanted us to know you're the type yeah, it was, of guy it was a rule yeah it was a, it, was, it was a steadfast rule i think it was like in season two you bought that rv and then you were just like yeah no pooping in the rv <laughs> yeah that's nothing wrong a, with that dude it, there is nothing wrong with it but when you say that to people who will never poop in your rv that's just a douchebag power move just letting you know yeah. trev is that what it was <laughs> yeah. okay. that's where it came around yeah 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 that's a that's like a, a, a an rv elitist douchebag power move it's okay. like guys i'm the only person that could take a dump in it however i do understand that power move because if you're cleaning, it's, it's the same reason why I sit to pee in my bathroom, right? I sit to pee in my bathroom because I don't want to clean it up. And I'm the person that cleans it. So I take measures in there to make sure that when I clean it, it's not going to be a mess. That's what Trevor's saying to you guys. So don't take it personally. You're welcome. So you no, but we now, because he brought it up, it's it's Jeff and I's like, like life dream. Life, life dream <laughs> is to finally just, hey, Trev, go look over there. And we're just going to run in. Oh, yeah. That's our mission. I'll do it specifically <laughs> after a night of boozing and some street meat, too. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Sky Dome street meat. There you go. That won't that won't come out, though. It'll be, it'll be a super clench. It'll be everywhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, dude. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that doesn't come out too good. No, that's right. Oh my God. Uh, but anyway, guys, I'm, I'm super excited for this podcast and, uh, really grateful that you're part of the show, really grateful that you're part of the network. And, uh, we're excited to work with you guys. We're excited to use your expertise for probably much cheaper than we would get it if you weren't involved in the network. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you. All right. Yeah. All right, buddy. I appreciate it. But thank you guys uh, for being part of the network. I don't want to hold up your show. I know you've got some uh, some housing prices to get to. I know you got mortgage rates to get to, interest rates, and a whole bunch of other shit, and you want to educate some people, and I don't want to uh, keep you from it. So thank you for uh, joining the network, and thanks for being part of it, guys. And uh, can't wait to watch the rest of this in the background and shit post you uh, in the private <laughs> chat as well. Perfect. We'll get Dean to shit in your RV for the first time. <laughs> yeah. It'd be an honor. I, I can take a dump in your RV, right, Trevor? <laughs> no. <you> go. <laughs> Not at all. Anyway, guys, have a great show. Thank you Thanks so much for, for having on. me. Really appreciate it. Uh, professional insight. Much, Welcome to the network, guys. Anytime. We'll talk awesome. to you soon. Awesome.
Thank you. Wow. That was kind of crazy. So to uh, our existing listeners from the last four years, you'll notice that we typically only if, if something went long, it, we very rarely went over 20 minutes, 25 minutes on, 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 on an episode, but we're only going to be recording live, um, you know, twice a month. And so we're going to be packing longer um, episodes uh, to, to cover the questions. So as always, uh, if you have a question or a comment, by all means, reach out to any of us at any point in time and, uh, we'll go from there. So let's just start it off. What's let's this, this Brenton, this, this Brenton guy right here. Is that the question you said was inquiring about us? I see on the yeah. right side or. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. You just noticed okay. that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious. This is a new format for me too. That's so right. I'm learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from Facebook, he said, welcome fellas. It's a shout out. It's a shout out, which mm -hmm. is nice. Well, you said there's a question though from somewhere, so I'm just no, curious. no, there was no question. Okay, no, I'm just saying if there is a question, hit us up in the chat. We can do it live, and if we don't know the answer, like I said, our next one, we will make sure that we bring on a um, an, an expert to speak should, about should it. Should we tell so everybody we, where we do get our hair gel? I got I got Walmart stuff here. I, I got get Shoppers Drug Mart. Yeah, I got to improve my hair gel. I got to get something more high end. Harrys.com, boys. Harrys.com. Yeah, you ever hear Harrys before? They, no. they started as shaving products. Okay. So they, they did shaving products. They, they were strictly in the U S. So I, when I used to have a post office box down there, I get, I'd place my orders, get it shipped to the box and, and all good. Now they do distribution out of Toronto. So Is it more uh, than $6 a bottle. Pardon me. Is it more than $6 a bottle? I, I honestly can't even tell you. I, like, I just, I buy a, a, a bunch of shit. At, like, I'll buy razors. I'll buy, you know, shaving cream, aftershave, body wash, shampoo. I'll buy all that stuff from them. Extra hold. We, we should, yeah. Like, hair, is it a paste? Do you have, like, a paste or a gel? Like, if you do a paste, paste or a gel? It's a paste. I, got a cream. I, gotta, I go with the paste, too. Yeah. I got a cream. It has more hold, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, if Harry's yeah. wants to be a sponsor, by all means, we reach go. out. We'd love to have you. Yeah, because I, I I've never I haven't seen it. I haven't. You guys seen should check anything. them out. They're they're wicked. Send they're a link for us. That'll what be a that? sponsor. Cool. Lots of recruitment now that we're on the big show. There yeah. we go. Yeah, big yeah. network, number one network pod, pod, podcast in Canada. There you go. Right. So so new beginnings is that that was the intro. So now we're going to the next topic here. Is that what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's and if you want to hop into that right now. Well, okay. So here's line bidding. okay. Uh, we, uh, we'll do. Do you want to do that or do you want to do contract law first? With, I think, I think let's do contract and we'll kind of go into the, the, the blind bit. Cause it'll, it's all gonna, I think it's it ties all gonna, together. Sure. It all ties sense. together. So, okay. and here's the situation for those that are listening. I, I, the, the, the boys know who we're talking about, but just obviously confidentiality. Uh, we just won't release those people or, or, or situations. So I'm going to keep, keep it as vague as possible. However, we'll, we'll release enough detail that you can kind of piece the story and put context to the story on what's going on. You can always reach so, out. Hmm? One of us may have, you know, if they've been scorched, may be happy to have a discussion with you, right? So yeah, exactly. Nothing. So in this particular example, I was talking to my electrician. Why? For those that you you'll remember, I don't know how a hammer works. So I have professionals that do everything for me: electrician, HVAC, all that kind of stuff. So you got a guy or girl? I I, I got a guy who knows a guy. Um, or girl. Or girl. Or or girl. Or girl. Or girl. Um, and, uh, they, um, what was it? So, so he was telling me a story and this is going to just going to definitely talk about bond. And then this is going to lead into the, the changes happening to escalator clauses and blind bidding, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a pool company. This deposit was made in 2021 and it is a, uh, okay. For, for materials sake, it's a fiberglass pool pool company. So that's all we're going to say. So this person lays it down, uh, lays down a deposit and um, doesn't hear back from them. And then finally, because of labor shortages and material shortages, whatever the case may be, 2022 comes around. They literally show up at his doorstep. Now, the gas has already been run. The electrical for the pump has already been run. Um, turns out that they told them to put it in the wrong spot. This is on the company. Um, and with three days notice, my electrician is like, I can't do that. You have to go with their particular guys. So long and short, they go to deliver and they're like, Oh, by the way, 
because it's been a year since you've signed your contract and prices have increased with materials, um, you now have to pay the increase on the contract of the, of the pool. So let's say the pool was, I don't know, throw a number 50 grand, installed the whole bit. Now it's over $60,000 and the client is on the hook for that $15,000 increase. So Josh, here's a question. What is going on here? And do they have legal recourse to do that? Because we've touched in previous episodes about contract law. And we, I just feel that with inflation, you're going to get a lot of these dodgy people trying to, to pull these stunts. So, I mean, it's difficult to comment on a contract until you actually read the contract itself because everyone is unique, right? Like, uh, so they'll have different provisions in it, but there's a lot of standard provisions that go into different contracts. Two of them of utmost interest would be um, a cost recapture um, provision and a force majeure provision, right? So a cost recapture is what you were talking about. If there's a provision in there that allows the, the supplier to tack on those additional costs onto them to the end user, then you're stuck with paying that higher price. That'd uh, be an escalation clause basically, right? The cost recapture? Yes. Right? That's agreed to ahead of time uh, that should that th those circumstances arise, you're, you're aware that you're responsible for those costs. Sometimes, and you, you in certain contracts, uh, a lot of contracts will have a force majeure. It's an act of God, right? Uh, but tied into that act of God, they have uh, pandemic language, right? So what you see in some contracts or what you're seeing in some contracts as a result of COVID pandemic is that people are able to kind of, you know, work their way around certain circumstances as a result of declaring it an act of God. Right or a for not an act of God, but a force majeure or a pandemic-driven uh, reason for maybe pulling out of that contract and maybe starting a new. But to to insist that you're paying that sixty thousand uh, or that increased price without an escalation clause um, and without language within the agreement. Uh, well, and, and you think if you're ordering a pool too, the pools are so backed up. That's why they're getting deposits ahead of time, you know. But when you get that deposit, if, am I right, Josh? Considerations made on both sides. There is a, a there is a contract signed. So unless there's wording in there, just just like in building, because this is something common in building right now. Unless there's wording for escalation with a certain timeline, that that pool company should be on the hook for the original price they had, unless they have separate wording there, right? Yeah, I mean, common in the build game right now. Let's bring it into the residential real estate resale, right? You've got well, to. It wouldn't really be residential resale, but like common right now is the build game. The build <laughs> game has escalation clauses. The resale. You enter into an agreement of purchase and sale two months ago. Yep. It closes two months later. Now, with the crazy real estate market, that that house of the price of that house is significantly more two months later, or less, or less. Can you go back and say, eh, I want more money? No. Nope. Right. <clears throat> so I guess the, the, the recourse, though, I guess, for the client is basically they'll turn around and th what, what do they do? They, they go and they, they'd have to take them to small claims court. Yeah, but then that's on that's those costs and everything is involved <laughs> because like if there isn't a clause, if there isn't an escalation clause. The company would have to take them to small claims court, though. You know, I mean, in those circumstances, I don't do litigation, so I'm going to qualify it by that. But in those circumstances, I would say pay the agreed upon price. And at the end of the day, if they want additional funds, then. But but I can see this from a pool standpoint. Now, you they... say I'm not paying the extra. They don't finish the pool. Now you're stuck in limbo. Right. You have a partially paid for pool. It's not finished. And you have no the... pool. If for in a, that, That's why I kind of put context with the fiberglass piece like. It's an insert. So if you don't pay it, then they can like they can withhold it, right? Like and they haven't they dropped have the pool, pool off yet. Then, they just right? won't. They just won't drop off the pool. Okay. But wouldn't it be usually cash on delivery, right? Like because nobody pays the full contract price until usually, right? Until things uh, 
things are well, done. Right. I, I, know, but, yeah. I think it comes down to you're going to have to look at the wording of the contract no matter what, right? It'd be the same in real estate or, or building. If there's an issue with the building, and this is common lately because with the prices jacking up and then there was a big story in Toronto of a condo builder and the prices went up quite a bit, the values, and then the materials went up quite a bit too, which is the bigger issue for the builders. And then the builder went back to all the people with deposits down and said, we want another hundred thousand dollars or we won't close. And that was an escalation clause. But once again, you can't comment on it unless you see the wording of the contract, because in a typical building one, and I think these are changing because of the landscape of the industry, in a typical building one, the, the buyer who's building with the builder is on the hook for any material increase, depending on how you write the contract, if it's increased before the time of construction. Time of construction being when shovel hits the ground or in a municipal house when, when water and sewer goes in. Once that, that shovel hits the ground, if there's any increases up to that time, in most contracts or the ones we use, the buyer who is building with us would be on the hook for the increases in land. Now, after that, but I'm sure that's changing, too, because now in the build industry, the lumber and, and everything really is going up on a day's notice and they're not giving the builders notice anymore. It's not like here's a 30 day lock in period. It's like a three day lock in period now. And if you don't buy and it goes up significantly with all the gas prices, some people are on the hook. So I think this contract law is very fluid right now. It's changing consistently because people are adapting to everything that's happening right now. So I guess we can piggyback this off of the the proposed uh, in the province of Ontario. Um, so for those that are listening, um, because we reside in the province of Ontario, even though we may know law or legalities in, in, in other of the provinces and territories, we typically speak uh, primarily where we reside, which is in the province of Ontario. So just for people to put context to that. So if you want any Further explanation, just let us know and we can kind of expand on BC or Newfoundland or whatever. Um, and I'm licensed provincially, so I, I, I'll restrict comments usually to, to the province. And my comments aren't to be taken as advice as others, right? It's right to us directly because it's all often case and fact specific. Right, exactly. You should just have a permanent dis display on your screen with disclosure. <laughs> I'm the I lawyer. I'm, this is, Please don't take any of this as actual legal advice. And if yeah. you read this, there's a $15 charge. <laughs> because it took you six minutes. Come on, his hourly rate is much more than that. So if it's yeah, only I know. six minutes, geez. Point, point, charge point six if it only takes some, you know. Right. So here's the, here's the question. Uh, proposed to get rid of the escalator clause in house home building contracts. Um, this affects directly you, Jeff. Um, what, what do you, and you're also a realtor, so that you can see both sides mm -hmm. in the sense that, um, as a home builder, uh, small, like a small home builder, you're not like, you know, your, your custom homes. Um, how do you, where do you foresee this going? What, what do you think will happen if that's the case? Well, are you talking about the blind bidding or the escalation clause being taken out? Uh, the escalation clause being taken. That's the proposal right now. The exclamation, exclamation, escalation clause being taken out. Well, see, that's a, it's a weird thing to do because what's going to happen if you take out the escalation clause, most builders won't pre-sell anything. They'll just, they'll, they'll build it first and then, and then list it and sell it. And the advantage of buying a pre-sale typically is you beat the market. So if you buy now and you lock in now for pricing and you don't close for, let's say a year or 18 months, in my experience lately, everyone who closes 18 months later have made a significant windfall. And that's where assignment sales come into. It's a common, it's a common way people make money where they'll pre-sell it. They jump on the early um, purchase and then they pre or they resell it before it closes and they make quite a, a profit. So these are the things they're trying to eliminate right now in, in the housing market because it's getting in my opinion, with, with the Ontario election coming up, they're attacking house prices everywhere. That's the hot tip, hot ticket, hot ticket item right now, and so they're looking at any way to get rid of that. So I, I find it really hard to get rid of the escalation clause. It is more or less a, a legal contract, so they'd have to eliminate contracts. And that's something Bond could probably talk on more because can, can you even do that? Because it's agreement between two people. So I'm not sure how they would just completely eliminate it. The builders just wouldn't wouldn't do it because they're not going to lose money on it. So I'm yeah. not sure. Have, Bob, it, what would you say to that? It'd probably create that new stage of uh, builder that would, Jeff, right? 
because I think there would be such a, a need for it. There would be people out there that would take the risk on it. Now, not wisely, and I don't, I don't profess to tell you that they're going to, in this current climate, be in business long. Um, but you know what I mean? More or less, the escalation clause there is protection for the builder that unforeseen increases in lumber. And the, the biggest example has been the pandemic. Yeah. where it's doubled and tripled and sometimes even four times the amount of materials were. So a, a easy example would be trusses. Trusses two years ago on a typical 1300 square foot house, you were looking between eight and 10. Now trusses have gone up to 15 and 20 for the same houses. Okay. Depend, depending on the difficulty and all that. Really, it's about a hundred percent increase in, in, in materials. Now, if a typical builder is running on a, on a profit margin of 10 to 15 percent, and then your materials double in price, you're going to road that down to a five to seven percent profit, and you might not be able to sustain a business like that, right? So that's the difficult part of it, and it's not just on lumber; it's on windows. It's on. I was talking to you guys the other day. A, a 14 foot typical garage door, we were buying around 1600 to 1800 dollars. Now we just got new garage doors for semis we're doing recently, and they're 4200 dollars. Now that's more than double the price for it. Guess who eats that? It's the builder. The builder's eating that price right there because they lock in prices. So in order to protect them against unforeseen increases that the industry is hitting on, and it's partially because of, of shortages, it's, it's because of, of shipping container delays, and it's also because of diesel and gas prices, right? Everything's going to, to raise the prices on everything, and, and it, it, it hits the builder. So now when we talk to people, we tell people it's a cost plus if you want to build with us, or we're just going to wait till we're done, and then we'll sell you the price at market value. People still hound you for pre-sales because they know they're going to make a significant amount of money before close. Yeah. So that's where it comes into. So if you want to get rid of those buyers who want to get rid of that profit that they make before close, that's fine. Like right now, our, our formula of doing business is we build them, finish them completely and then sell. And then we make a more protected profit. But if the market starts to come down where it's balancing out right now, then you have to reassess and think, should we pre-sell them again? The problem's going to be materials are high and we don't know which way they're going to go. So, so then do you think problem. that if we, we do do like it may go to a cost plus scenario, in which case that would uh, potentially it would protect the builder, it would protect, it the, would builder. protect the builder, which a, a lot of custom home builders do go cost plus, mm -hmm. um, but it protects the builder. But at the end of the day, that can completely sideways a, uh, you know, a, a, a financial deal. So let's let's hop in Trevor here because you deal on the mortgage side of it. And so can you, if, if in, in, a, in a cost plus scenario where you get a mortgage, uh, uh, sorry, a, con a construction mortgage with your, if you're cost plus, um, how do you, uh, what would happen in this case with, with costs keep going skyrocket? So if they, if basically if they have to add an extra hundred thousand dollars to yeah. the original purchase price, what would they do? Yeah, it's going to depend on whether it is a uh, progress advance. So what's often referred to as that construction mortgage, right? So people are, um, you know, closing on the land and then the builder is going to pour the foundation and then you give the builder some money and then the builder is going to get the property. Um, it's going to get framed. It's going to become airtight, give the builder more money. That's going to be one way. Um, the other way is the way most people buy is most people typically buy a new construction that it's just. It, you know, you, you enter into the agreement, the closing date, um, you know, with the critical dates from Terry on say, you know, here's our, our closing date. And then at that date, um, you know, it, when we're in the moving parts area of the actual progress advance, uh, it's a real tricky area because the bank lender credit union is kind of advancing money as you're going. Um, so to have costs, typically as the consumer, you're going to eat a lot of those overruns, um, at least up front, and then potentially have it re-adjudicated, so re-approved and reassessed by an underwriter uh, in the future when we're talking on a, a new construction completion basis. Uh, so the latter option it's hard because, you know, potentially we're here, we're into a legal agreement. Um, we have the mortgage approval in place. We're in a rising interest rate environment. And then all of a sudden the qualifying rate changes. Uh, it's a real, real sticky situation. And, and 
dangerous for a lot of people. So that's why, you know, Josh will say to you, um, you know, if you're one of his clients, you review those new construction agreements ahead of time so that the borrower is fully aware and, and understanding that this stuff could happen. I, I don't, in what crazy world, I apologize, guys. On my end, my screen, my, my video is frozen, so I don't know if it, it's buggered up or not. But We can uh, see you just fine, buddy. Yeah. He does come off glitchy to me, though. Like, his is the only one that kind of glitches a little bit. I don't know about you guys. You guys are fine. Just just Josh's. Yeah, Josh. I don't know. Way to go. Way to ruin it for everybody, Josh. Um, but nonetheless, I don't... In what world do we live in where somebody signs a contract without, you know, somebody getting with in the know, taking a good look at that? Oh, my God. It happens, it all, happens the all the time. All the time. All the time. Yeah. The time. Oh, my God. It's insane. Where do I sign? Click, 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 click. It's done. I'm like, did you read the contract? Do you want me to go through it? No, I trust you. That's it. It's insane. I, I mean, uh, so, you know, I mean... Uh, to that point, Trev, like it's so difficult and frustrating on our end when you get those people that don't have somebody, whether it's a lawyer, whether it's the agent, uh, your best friend who's uh, well versed in contracts. I don't care. Somebody better than the layperson that can point these provisions out to you to say, hey, you know what? Pay special attention to this thing, right? For sure. Right. Well, I think that's why we're doing this episode, though. It, it, you know, it's to bring attention for everybody this escalation clause, or to see how important it is to read over your contract. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Like, I'll have another instance right now for contracts for that, where I have a client who wants to move to to Toronto. Okay, so I'm not dealing with them on the buyer side. Now, me and Trevor were talking about this yesterday. Actually, we won't yeah. mention any names, but this person would like to buy in Toronto. And so they're going to purchase there. I talked to them on my behalf. I'd love to have found them a client, but they already are an agent there that I trust, but I didn't, you know, so, you know, they're coming to me after because I have to sell their home here. But they're going to purchase. And in certain areas in GTA, the land transfer tax is double than it is in Niagara. So if you grow up in Niagara, you buy and sell in Niagara, when you purchase the land transfer tax, there's a calculator online that you can use. But in certain areas of GTA, and I don't know the areas, so I'm not going to mention the city, but it is something very close to it. The property tax in that particular area compared to Niagara region would be 26,000 in Niagara and 52,000 in this GTA area. But the the agent didn't even mention it to them at all. And so I'm going through with them, trying to go through their, their dollars and cents and trying to figure out what they have. And I'm like, well, did your agent even say that? And no, because the agent probably is under the assumption everyone buying there would know that, but you should talk to everybody when you're doing it. And really in that case, the buyer could go after the agent after as a, like part of our errors and omission insurance and say, they never explained to me. So then it becomes a battle right there too, where if you're doing it properly, you should disclose that up front or, or bring that to your buyer's attention. If you don't, what could be on the hook here is an extra $26,000 you weren't expecting. But a lot of times people don't want to go through it. They zone out when you're talking about the contract and then it's all, they never said that. And then it's a he said versus she said, say, well, I did explain it to you, you weren't paying attention. And it's so it can get ugly. Well, and it's funny too, right? Because how often do they sign on the dotted line, right? And then when shit hits the fan or there's an issue, then they they look for the person to blame. Well, and yeah. that's the key on most contracts. They have a place you got to initial. As soon as you initial anything, it's saying that you understood what you're initialing there. Exactly. And that's the cover your ass for the agent, the insurance, or the lawyer, all that stuff. So if you're initialing, Make sure you know why you are initialing there. It's probably a, a point of emphasis. That's why they're telling you initial it. You know, yeah. even in those circumstances, though, people will take a run at you, even oh, when yeah. you yeah. their name to that document, right? Where you've explained this to them. Ah, you didn't explain that to me, right? They, oh. they, temporary amnesia when something goes wrong, right? Yeah. And, and Trevor said, I think it was Trevor. You know, they want somebody to blame other. Right. Well, exactly. Like I had that recently happen to somebody where they were, uh, we had discussed fixed versus variable. We had the conversation. Um, they said, we're going to go variable. Okay. Perfect. Get the approval in place. Mortgage is approved as a variable rate mortgage. Hey, here's the copy of the, uh, the commitment is attached to the email. Um, you know, I, and because of COVID everything, you know, is kind of resorted to a life of remote working. So I do the, the scenario with the client. You want to hop on a Zoom, telephone call, your choice. Here's your information and let me know. No, we're good. We'll sign. And they just, they got to signing the document. 
Uh, the partner calls me up, asks me, hey, is this fixed or variable? I explain, okay, this is why we do it. Anyways, the long and short, a month later, variable rates go up. So this is, you know, February, we're now into March, variable rate goes up by a quarter point and they're upset or the one party is upset by the increase and basically gave me some constructive feedback that going forward, just attaching the legal documents for them to review and read and offering for to review them with them isn't enough. I should be breaking down in the body of the email. Here are the details in the commitment attached. Read the document. We're out. Read the document. Basically. You're you're a right? big boy like, or a girl. Like, yeah, right. Like we're we're grown adults. Yeah. It's on us. We need you know. And then the fact that you sign the documents. And, yeah. And you know my my bro like Nate Dominion Lending Centers. Bill always says he's our owner. Always says it's not if you get sued, it's when. So when it comes <laughs> to our compliance documents and how we prepare ourselves and like. We're, nobody's doing anything shady here, but we're protecting ourselves to make sure that, hey, at the end of the day, these are all the details of your mortgage commitment. Here's all the details, terms, services, everything associated with it. Here you go, guys. Read it. It's there. You've acknowledged that you've reviewed it. So if guy or girl that's not going to take the time to read it, but just put your name to it, you don't have any grounds. You have nothing to go back on. You've Trev, agreed to I'm it. Tell, telling you, I take pride in sitting down and, you know, Jeff will attest this. We've done, I don't know how many tens of transactions, and I still explain to them the documents, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and you, even did, you even did it with me with my will and power of attorney, too. I still think that there's enough silly people out there that once in a while even though you've explained it and even though you've they've signed off on it i'm certain when the shit hits the fan they're going to be looking to point the finger at somebody right yeah and to all of our listeners that are listening to the podcast right now just to reiterate josh is not on the can he just has it just sounds like he is but it's not he's in harry he has potter a microphone land. he's in harry potter land somewhere in the back We'll get them um, to the future episodes. I, it's all good. Yeah, we're we'll all figured out. See, I like I like to kind of add something there. Like, I think whatever professional you're working with, they they always majority of the time have your best interest in mind. Okay, but but you, you do have to pay attention when when you're you're signing legal contracts, especially you know like on housing and stuff like that, because you're talking what's the average house price in Niagara now? Probably six hundred thousand dollars right now. Oh, easy, yeah. So you're 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 spending that kind of money or, or sign a contract to that, you know? L let's listen and prepare it, and make sure you understand it. Like a lot of times, people won't realize about the deposits and all that, you know? Like if if you're going out with any conditions, you could definitely you know lose your deposit, or or even worse, you you suffer litigation on close if you can't close on it, right? It's it's such a changing market right now, especially in real estate. It's like that's the hot ticket item right now because of the election coming up and they're trying to solve the housing shortage right now, which it cannot be done. Um, but, you know, th that's what they're trying to do to get everybody's attention. So that's what's on everybody's minds right now is housing, housing, housing because of the prices in, in, in flux, right? It's but just still be careful. Most people's most expensive asset. Yeah, most people's. It, why wouldn't you have somebody review the agreement? Yeah. Because people are idiots. You know, it's the cost. Right. They don't want a lawyer to look at it because yeah, it's which is just, it. They don't want to do it. Yeah, Listen, but you're yeah, already no, hiring I, the liar, the lawyer to close the transaction, right? So the liar oh, lawyer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. liar lawyer. Yeah, sorry, the liar <laughs> lawyer. Yeah, that's right. I guess it depends on the lawyer, right? Just like it depends on the realtor, depends on the mortgage broker, depends on the financial advisor. You're gonna have those that are gonna be less diligent, and others that are going to be more diligent, right? We so, always do it, but a lot of times it's after the fact, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, so it's, it's on it's this. whenever it costs somebody money, that's when they're going to look into it, right? As soon as it costs you money, that's when they look into it and they find out why is this cost you money, you know? And if it costs them more money they're expecting, they're looking to, you know, to 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 get that somebody back eat that cost and not them. 
Well, and, and that's the problem. Like when you've got rates going up, like everyone's been warned now, you got houses that went up. Now you've got houses that are kind of coming down a little bit and all that. It's a completely changing market. And it's, out, you know, it's stuff out of people's factors, like wars in, in Ukraine and, and gas prices and stuff that nobody were foreseeing. Like who thought a pandemic would jack prices so much in the housing market? Like in say, since the pandemic began. Yeah, like yeah, when I tell people honest. about houses, I say, look, this is a snapshot in time of where I think the house price is. It's like gas prices, right? One day it's a dollar twenty, and then two months later you're at a buck sixty, and then you're going to two dollars, and then it comes back down. You know, it's it's up and down, and you can't time the market. That's the problem. I think you told me same that thing with interest rates. Right? Time the market. No, yeah. Well, I mean, Does, yeah, you you it's time in the market. You cannot time the market if you try to do that. And you're just you're. Not, that's the best the way for real estate. The, and the best majority way for of the time, you look at houses every five years, years, it's up. You know, on, yeah. on a micro timeline like from month to month it might go up or down but year over year it's still going up in canada well here's you know? and and this is great this is a great transition blind bidding yeah. okay so um so and that actually wasn't staged and you actually did a really good job that was good there now um blind bidding is proposed okay. to um be uh, uh, i guess outlawed and so yeah. a blind bid for anyone that doesn't know um is basically when you know, your one realtor accepts bids, but no other bidder under that that is trying to purchase the the real estate property knows what the other bidder put in. And what they've done now, some great realtors like the one on this program, who, if you listen to previous uh, episodes, uh, did uh, sell my rental condo um, a while back, way while back, and uh, he had a bet on air, and he he exceeded what he did. I didn't expect that at all. Um, but there were multiple offers and, you know, I benefited from a blind bidding perspective because they knew that there was multiple offers and you did it in an ethical way. There was no, but then on, there's the other side of it where, um, I know people who have been used in a blind bidding process purely by just kicking a tire and seeing what's for sale. And that realtor was sitting with just one bid on the property ends up you know, using that, ver you know, that verbiage, that phone call and saying, Hey, there's another person interested or you, you know what you want off your bid um, or double ending the deal. So I guess, Jeff, this is to you um, because I also lived in Australia for three years and in Australia, they use a live auction situation where you're out on the street, essentially uh, live auctioning off on, on, a, on a piece of property. So what's your opinion on that, uh, Jeff? Well, it's, it's different. I, like, I think there could be benefits to both of them. Like, I'll explain blind bidding so people exactly know what it is. If you're representing a seller and there's more than one offer coming in, this is where a blind bidding situation comes up. Now, the, there is problems with it and there's benefits to it. The benefit is to the seller typically. It gives them top dollar and that's what people want. Okay. But when you're buying, people don't want to pay top dollar. So there's two sides of the coin because if you're buying a property one day, you're going to be selling it. So when you're selling it, you want top dollar because when you're buying it, you might have to pay top dollar. But the problem people have with it is when you're the listing agent, the sellers, you're the only one who knows what's going on with the offers. Okay. So if eight offers come in, you'll have to say how many offers there are, but you don't have to say what conditions are on them. So for example, if someone has a sale of property condition, a financing condition, no conditions or anything like that. And you also have to say which brokerage is from. So if it's your own brokerage, you have to say that. If it's a different brokerage, you don't have to mention which one, but you'll have to say it. So the problem herein lies is, for example, if you have a house for a million dollars for sale <clears throat> and then you have six offers come on it and then five of the offers are between a million and a million fifty thousand. And then the six offer really wants to win it and they go 300,000 over. What they want to eliminate is that gap between the highest, the second highest offer and the new offer. But the seller doesn't want to eliminate that. But the buyer does because it'll keep house pricing down. So the last two years during the pandemic, quite a few of, of blind bidding has happened where the prices were inflated because the winning bid might have been quite a bit higher than the second bid. So you have to look at it and say, as a whole, do we want to eliminate that? Because as a seller, you want to keep that as a buyer. You don't want to. So this is where the argument comes in because the buyers are hot right now because they don't want to pay these prices. As a seller, they want to get as much as they can. The problem here is when you go into a, a bidding war or a live auction, 
you could have multiple parties that are hungry for it and it potentially could could escalate the, the price even higher because you could say a million okay a million fifty a million one a million two a million three it could even go higher we don't know how it'll go okay but you could really get caught up in the emotion of it right there we're right now in a bidding process typically or not all the time because you can change it everybody puts their best bid in and then the highest bid takes it sometimes they're close and you'll go back and say would you like to improve your offer but there's also ways that you can spin it spin it fake it there's unethical things but there's unethical things that could happen in every single industry and i don't i don't kind of go to that because i think that's you know one bad apple can ruin the whole bunch because there, there could be a small amount of people for that but our brokerage which one of the top brokerage royal page nrc in niagara anytime we have a blind bidding process in one of our listings we keep every single offer because if there's ever people going to the board or going after us for litigation we can say look here's all the ones that were there here's what we did this is why we did it. okay so that's how it goes there's times where a blind bidding process where some agents might take a one that was lower than the the other ones that are out there and then that agent might go after him because they said why does that not happen but there's more than just money on, on the line when you're bidding too so that's kind of a blind bidding what they want to do i don't know what the best answer would be I can see a trial run helping out to see how it goes, but sometimes people's best intentions work out to become nightmares. So right now, I believe Doug Ford doesn't want to get rid of blind bidding. They want to give people the option. So you could go, if you're the listing person, either blind bidding or an auction style, they want to give the seller the option, but that hasn't been been done yet. Well, we might- So I got two questions bring... for that. Yep. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Please. I got, I got two questions for that. So the one um, you had mentioned previous blind bidding and uh, if there's multiple offers, an agent cannot uh, or is not supposed to disclose if there's conditions on it, right? Yeah. Can an agent hint whether there are conditions or not? Like for example, You're we've got two offers, to. we've got two offers that come in and uh, you know, playing one against the other after the fact that both actually have conditions of finance one offers higher the other offer is lower the real estate agent on the other side game and says hey you know we really like your offer um you know it's a little bit lower than the other one are you willing to come up no not willing to come up well you know what if you drop your conditions right you know the, well, the other one doesn't have it or maybe does have it you can imply what you want to really in that situation you should sign back and it's a counter offer right and then you can eliminate the condition of financing right and if they don't accept it then you're back to it right but you're really not supposed to disclose any part of the offer or a hint i'm sure it happens but you, you you shouldn't be doing that right it's really a counter offer if you want to do that so an example here the person trying to buy in toronto and i'm looking over the offer to make sure she's protected and i said look it's a changing market right now there's no, this is the problem. It's one, it was a, I'll put the numbers, but I won't put the names. 1.5, they went in at 1.45 <clears throat> and then they wanted to counter offer. And, the, and I said, look, no matter what you do, put a sale property condition on there because I can't guarantee you what I can sell your house for. And I don't want to put you in a situation where you have to sell your house because then your price could potentially drop and you won't be able to close the deal. So they put a sale property condition, financing condition, inspection, blah, 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 blah. In this market, which we're coming out of a crazy hot market of multiple offers where there's barely any conditions, which I think is a big problem. I think adding a mandatory due diligence would probably be a great way to do real estate, but that's another argument. <clears throat> they got rid of her sale of property condition. They got rid of her inspection and they asked for only nine days for financing. So my advice was to her, no, sign back the sale of property or you're gonna have to walk and find another property or sell your house with a long close and let's go hunting or go hunting. Because you don't want to put your client in a situation where they're committed to another house and their house isn't selling and then potentially could backslide on price. Because as much as the market is where it is, it could potentially get worse or better. We don't know. You know, so we're reading the tea leaves here. Well, but they should be telling you the particulars of it. They can sign back, though, and say, all I would do in that situation, and it takes more work, but you got two offers that are close. Take the better offer that you think is better. Sign back. Eliminate the, the, the financing clause. And if they take it, great, because they could always come back and add it back in. And then that's their, they're drawing their line in the sand. But they should be saying, well, you know, they have finance and you don't. Can you get rid of that? You know, verbally shouldn't be doing that. Any kind of offer should be a counter offer on paper. Or, like you said, would you like to improve your offer? Yeah, and you now, can ask that. Offer from agent to agent. Like, 
you know in this market that you go in with conditions, there's likely... But, but that's a changing market now. So yeah. conditions are coming back. Prices are dropping. Cancellations are happening because the market's changing. And that's how you know as a realtor when the markets are changing. When it's on the upswing, you can't get any conditions whatsoever. Correct. I, I was so sliding back to balance. Conditions get get brought back into the negotiations because it's becoming more. But we balanced. still have, we still have agents fighting. Yeah, we do to get them removed, right? Yep. Like yep. so, a mandatory yep. diligence period makes it's way more sense than eliminating bidding, right? Yeah, and if like ten so, days of mandatory due diligence, I think is great. They have them on new build. The, exactly. Yep. So ten why days, is there a lot of new construction? Right? Why is it acceptable new construction but not, not on resale? Not sure. land transfer tax. You you get too, a because, land transfer tax. Well, the difference on new construction is everything's got to be adhered to the building code. And when you resell a house, that's got nothing to do with anything. Like I've seen so many resale houses that, for example, like a big thing is on the front step, there's no railing on there. You have to have railing on, on steps that have a fall off of two feet or 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 higher. So if you're at Let's see, 20, 24, 25 inches, you have to have a railing. Yep. It wouldn't pass a final occupancy on a new build, on a resale one, all the time. You'll see a horizontal rail True. on there. The kids can climb up and jump off the side, you know? It's got nothing to do with it. So so a new build, you're kind of protected because you, you have to adhere to the, the building code and you have to get a, a permit closed. So just a higher standard on a new build. But why not bring so I guess accountability then? Right. Bring accountability, sure. bring more accountability to your industry. Curry's industry, my industry, heavily bond at yours as well, of course, but we're heavily regulated and, and like Curry business now is required to, instead of just know your customer, a KYC, know it's product. known in the business, you have to know your product. So you need to be able to have a compliance put together to say, I know, you know, I, I recommended this product to the client because of you know, this is what this product offers versus that. So put more accountability to you guys as, as realtors. I guess like, more like work, me, but. Me, me holding the, like the, wearing the hat of a builder. Now I look at it and I see the advantage of actually having a builder code kind of taken care of, because you know, when you get that house, it's a safe house. Yeah. But, but in, in, in the resale or flipping industry, there's so many flippers out there. And usually if you're a top of the line for construction, and all that, you're probably building, not flipping houses. Flipping is a pain in the ass. Okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of people make money on that. The problem with new build or, or with flips, and I'll see them all the time. And I'll tell my clients, I say, look, this is a flip looks great. I don't know what's behind the walls there. When you're doing it with the permit, which most flips aren't done with a permit, a permit the city has to come in and see what's behind the walls, the electrical, you know, if there's junction box hidden, you know, what kind of insulations in there, the framing, all this stuff has to be done in the code. In a flip, there's nothing like that. Right. And, and this is a big argument I'm getting into right now because I'm trying to build my house and I'm trying to get a permit for the basement. Now, all four of us right here, do you know anybody who's done a basement without a permit? Everybody Tons. has. Everybody does. Would yeah, yeah. 80% of people don't get permits in the basement? I'd That's probably higher. choose higher. I potentially higher. The government wants to put some more accountability in that. Start knocking on doors and see if there's permit done in all these basements for them. Because I guarantee you there's not. But they don't want to do that because you're going to have such an uproar. Because if you don't have a permit in your basement, what can the city make you do besides fine you up to $50,000? Because I looked into this recently. They can make you rip all your drywall out to look at the frame behind it. And what but then that's where title about. insurance comes in. Right, title that's a title insurance, insurance in, but, topic. But what would happen there? There's a good question. If person willfully finished their basement without getting a permit, what do you think insurance is going to say? They're going to say, "Screw you! You no, did it. I, you you contravened the law. We're not protecting you on title." Yeah. Insurance. So, so I'm trying. Like, I'm I'm playing the the side of I buy my house with a finished basement. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I do my due diligence. We determine there's no uh, no open permits or anything on the property. I uh, all said and done, I close on it. Then I find out after the fact that it wasn't permitted. Mm -hmm. That's where title, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Bondo, but that's been, even when I worked in title insurance, that's my understanding. Well, what would of, title insurance do? They'd go after the previous <laughs> owner probably, right? Yes. You don't, you don't do, you don't do the, the uh, work order search uh, on resales, right? That's title insured. So if you yes. buy, uh, you buy the property, you should have an, 
uh, on you have a what that. theory you kind of cut out there? I did or Curry? You did. Oh, you should have an endorsement to, on your title insurance policy that covers you for, for, uh, Oh, there we go. We got someone who just wrote in there, Melissa Woodcock. Yeah. My house yeah. had a finished basement. The foundation leaked insurance wouldn't cover it. There you go. There we go. Thank you, Melissa. And Melissa, why wouldn't they, uh, why wouldn't they cover it? Yeah, you can do it on the book of faces and we'll, oh. well, let's keep going. Let's see what she says. Yeah, well, that's, no. that's, see, that's interesting right there because that's a good battle. But but to me, that's a, that's a, a loophole that could get closed up that would only benefit potential buyers. And the problem that's not happening right now is because it's it's because it's considered maintenance. Because it's con it's considered maintenance. Huh. Oh, a leak in the basement. Oh, okay, so that's an outside concrete one right there. A leak that like what would be referred to as a, a, a patent or latent defect. See, and see, as a, as a new build. A foundation is protected by the set by the the builder for up to seven years for foundation. So if and we've looked into this. So if you can take two loonies and put it in the hole in the side of the foundation, and you can fit it in there, the builder has to take care of it. That's the first seven years. The problem is, as soon as it gets past seven years, there's no more warranty on that stuff. So it is kind of considered maintenance on there. And this is the problem because when I go looking at houses with clients. As soon as I see a concrete block foundation, I tell them straight up, there's water coming in. Okay. And you'll talk to a realtor and say right away, is it dry down? It's perfectly dry. doesn't matter. Typical concrete block foundations, in rare cases, they're still built with that. They're 50 years old, probably. So the problem yep. with a concrete block, it's hollow in the inside, right? And it's pieced together like bricks. Okay. But, you know, you don't know this, but it's full of water. So on the inside, it's full of water. And the problem is in the wintertime, when it freezes, they start to shift, right? So typically water's coming in somewhere. Now, back then, yeah, it's a 50-year-old house. 50 -year -old so, so that's house. Yeah, it Melissa could have been concrete block house. there too, Melissa. Um, but when you have the older house like that, a lot of them, they don't have delta wrap on the outside. So now when you build a house, and I wish they had in the old time, and the way to fix it is actually from the outside. So you dig all the way down. The weeping tiles at 50 years could also be plugged up so it's water coming in too. So it is kind of a maintenance issue right there too, but you have to dig all the way down. You have to unclog the weeping tiles and in many cases replace it because a lot of times it's clay and it breaks down and then it's getting all built in with dirt. A lot of times now they have big O that goes around there and it's got a sock around it. So the water will come in there and drain out. <clears throat> but the way to fix it, unfortunately, is to excavate all around the outside, which is costly. The labor is pretty high intensive. Um, you have to replace the weeping tile. You have to put a Delta wrapper on it, probably tar it and then, refill rebackfill for it and you're probably looking at a typical thousand square foot house anywhere from 20 to thirty five thousand dollars right now and most people can't they don't want to foot that bill it's way too expensive and another case right there with purchase plus trevor we've done this before purchase plus considers waterproofing maintenance so they won't loan you money to improve your house on that so in a way they do consider that maintenance too so i would advise clients that they do consider waterproofing and house maintenance unfortunately thanks for the yeah, information so, just yeah, just if we were talking, blue skin's the best way to do it too, Melissa. That's the absolute best way to do it. We were talking about uh, open work orders. So that's when somebody had applied to say the municipality to, to, to affect some kind of renovation to the property and didn't actually have it closed out. In those instances, if you've got an endorsement in your title insurance policy uh, for the, the work order endorsement, your title insurance at that point in time should cover you. For a leaky foundation, unfortunately, um, it's a buyer beware situation all the time. Not sure if you had it inspected. A lot of times there's not much recourse against your inspector because they don't do intrusion. They don't go behind the, the uh, drywall and, and stuff like that. Um, but if the sellers uh, knew about it or ought reasonably to have known about it, then um, you could have recourse against that. See, see, this is the weird part, though. If it's concrete block, water is coming in. Regardless if it's dry, yeah. it's 50 years, water's coming in, it's shifted enough yep. for that. So you do need to excavate it, delta wrap it, or even better, blue skin. Blue skin is the best way to do it possible. Um, so that's your best way to do it. But, but I advise my clients, when we're looking at houses, I don't care if it's dry right now. In my mind... It's got water coming in. And I've got a good client that that that, that I work with that, that does waterproofing. And to give you an idea, he's so backed up 
He's so backed up that you, you look at like a year sometimes to get him to waterproof your basement. It's because really? every time it's concrete block, it needs to be waterproof. You might be able to get away for a little while, but if you have a really wet season, um, if you have a really wet season, um, you know, then then you're gonna have water coming in. And it's terrible, you know. Insurance company could be a battle too, because they could claim it's maintenance or 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 maybe not. So if you are signing your paper, here's another thing for contract law. If you're signing your papers with your insurance company, see if it does cover water damage in the basement and what kind of water damage, because there could be septic water, there could be rainwater, there could be any kind of water, right? So you gotta make sure it's all covered. Now yeah. to on that piece, I mean, thanks for the question, yeah, Melissa. Yeah. yeah, Melissa, that was a great question and great comments. Thanks. And very sorry much. for <laughs> sorry for your experience there. It's it, it's terrible, but you know what? Blue skin is the best way to do it, and you should be good for now on out. Yeah, we're um we're we're sad to hear that. Um, so I guess and everyone that's listening and watching on these channels, this is the first time we've we we we've, we've we've got this. So just connect with us. We don't know how. Chris, uh, uh, our, our, the, the genius behind this, this entire podcast, will figure it out and get, get it over to us because we don't know how to figure this it's out. It's cool. It's real time. This though, is pretty so cool. Like, this is real time. Yeah, so like it's that. like it. So we're, we're loving it. Um, so the other thing is, is uh, so Trev, you, you can piggyback off of this, and, and that is the change of interest rates. And then we're going to probably talk briefly and try to wrap it up nicely on <laughs> oh. the potential recession, uh, like that people are. Are, are talking about, but well, let's go with the interest rates piece. So Trev quarter of a basis point. So sorry to get all of our listeners up to speed when, when Trevor and, and myself uh, speak about basis points, a real easy way that I like to use. Um, and it is think of an, an 1%. Okay. Think of it in a decimal form. It is represented by 1.00%. So that's, 1% represented in decimal form. And therefore, what does that mean? That's 100 basis points. So 1% is 100 basis points, right? So a 25% 25 basis point increase, that would mean it would be 0.25, which is a quarter of a percent or a quarter of 100. And a lot of the professionals out there, economists and, and any of these like investments, um, investment companies will say, oh yeah, quarter of a basis point, 50 basis points, 75 beeps. You'll hear beeps a lot too. Um, that's just, you know, that's slang, that's talk. But Trev, Bank of Canada in March, yep. in their meeting in March, a yeah. quarter of a basis point increase. Yeah. So we had Bank of Canada go up by, so basically in a nutshell, uh, for those that are unaware, uh, Bank of Canada is what we see that drives the overnight lending rate. So the, the prime rate, if you're in a variable rate mortgage, you got a line of credit. Um, those types of products are going to be affected by the Bank of Canada. And so the March meeting, Bank of Canada, uh, on March 2nd, went up by 25 basis points, quarter percentage point. Uh, and obviously, you know, part of the reason for that is because of inflation is as high as the numbers are. They're trying to, to tamp down. Uh, and by raising interest rates, that's one way they try and manipulate it. Uh, all of a sudden, Wednesday, April 13th rolls around and Bank of Canada had uh, had decided they were going to jump the 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 overnight lending rate by 50 basis points so half a percentage point uh in a very short period of time over those 6 weeks we went up by 0.75% their goal very much is to to as to what's referred to as net neutral net neutral is basically uh you know from their perspective is between 2 and 3% uh keep in mind that the banks lenders credit unions are above that two to three percent level, so that would put us at a at a four point two to five point two percent range. That's where they're trying to get the interest rate. Uh, and the reason for the net neutral is there's no benefit, uh, like there's no stimulation and there's no contraction uh, by having it at net neutral in, in in theory. So it's been a wild roller coaster ride for a lot of people, right? People are, uh, are concerned the news and people got to realize too, like the, the newspapers, uh, the television stations, every they're selling ad space, uh, they're selling subscriptions. So do your homework, right?
right? Read, read into it a little bit deeper. The, the doom and gloom that's upon us uh, that you read every day in the paper might not be, you know, as bad as it yeah. actually is. To put it in someone's terms today, uh, uh, an extra interest rate increase on $100,000, how would it affect them? Yeah. So what I always say to clients is for every quarter point increase, so every 0.25% that you get in an overnight lending rate increase, your mortgage payment will change by approximately $13 per hundred thousand dollars that you have borrowed. So you got a $200,000 a mortgage. It's going to change by about 26 bucks a month, a $400,000 mortgage, about 52 bucks a month per quarter point so increase. Percentage points, 52 bucks for every hundred thousand. That's if you're yes. on a variable mortgage. If you're on a variable rate mortgage, but here, like at the same time, <laughs> fixed versus variable right now, fixed rates are, are hitting four and a half percent, right? Four, so four. if you're in a variable rate mortgage where prime right now is 3.2 and pretty much everybody is in a prime minus scenario where they're getting a discount on that 3.2, the bare minimum discount people are getting half a point. Right. So that, that puts them at a 2.7 interest rate versus a four and a half rate. In a lot of cases, when you start doing the math, there's about a 400 to $500 difference in your mortgage payment, taking variable versus taking fixed. Right. Now, oh, yeah. And that's rate, interest. They, they wanted to raise interest rates last year though. Right. And they just couldn't because they were in the middle of the pandemic. So this is kind of long overdue, right? They talked about it. They they should have definitely been more strategic. Uh, yeah. They they definitely we're we're late to the game. They should have started this a year ago. But that's and been show, gradual. Right? They should have did it last year. That would have cooled the market a bit last year, and they're doing it now. And it looks like an all out attack on on house prices right now because they've raising interest rates. They've eliminated foreign buyers for two years, right? And they're Which looking at other ways to kind of the market. Doesn't do anything. Yeah, well, it's a small percent, but but every yeah, little like, percentage has a somewhat cooling effect. You know, a minor. Yeah, but at the a minor same time, right when we had Kevin Krieger, the president of Treb on, right, yeah. not too long ago, he talked like Curry just said it: four or five percent of the total people purchasing in, in GTA, Canada. Was, yeah, in Canada, right? And he was it was similar to to GTA statistic. So yeah. is it really <laughs> doing anything? No, it's but, the it's the impression that they're doing. Well, it isn't the impression, but you but, slip service. But, yeah, but you also have to remember, guys, like the devil's in the details. And I'll say this quite a bit throughout the podcast for all of our listeners. Like, look at what, like, it sounds great to what Trevor's saying, but the details of that. Well, you are exempted if you're on a worker's permit. You're exempted if you're on a student visa. You're exempted if you are on track for a permanent residency. So all you have to do, if you're like to what Dean started this podcast off on, if you're a multi-billionaire in China or, you know, name an Asian country, doesn't matter, or a foreign country, doesn't matter. And you want to, there's nothing that prevents you from owning it in an Ontario corporation. So there's nothing that says that you can't feed your Ontario corporation, send your send your student, uh, send your child to UFT, make them the president of 1234 Ontario Corp and go and buy that house. Right. There's nothing that stops that right now because all this, this law that they just put into place federally, not provincially for those that are listening, is that it just prevents people from another country coming into Canada and buying it. And there's, and there's different loop, uh, loopholes in, in the law. Well, I think and they're trying to why, prevent people from buying it, holding it from another country, selling it, just right. making the profit, and never stepping correct. in yeah. Canada soil. That's correct. Yeah. So there, there is that piece it, too. So is it going to actually do anything? And then I have this great, I got this great, um, uh, I want to show you guys the screen that I'm going to share right now. That's Ooh, we can do that? We well, yeah. See. Can you guys see this? The comparison yep. of fixed versus variable rates? Ooh. There we go. Look at that. That screen. This is, this is going back on your tech. Yeah, I know. Yeah, this is Canada. Right. I don't know what I did, but I did it. So I'm pretty happy. Um, Lucky you leave the Canada, other picture by accident. <laughs> Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. So this is right from CMHC. This yep. is going to piggyback on what Trevor has, has been saying all along, and he'll continue to recommend variable. And this is why. Here is your 25-year average, the orange line of... Fixed rates going back 25 years. Here is your average variable for the last 25 years. So we're talking at just over 4% for variable, just under 6% for fixed. 
And then if you go, if you go along the dark line versus the gray line, gray line, the light gray line, that is fixed. Variable is this num this dark blue line right here. Without with some rare exceptions, which would be just before the financial crisis in 2007. July 98 was a terrible time. And July 98 right here, <laughs> variable true. has won every single time. Every and let's single be honest, time. where in a couple of those circumstances, it's just the variable and the fixed have just matched one another. The difference though, when you're fixed, Not you July lock 98. in at that moment in time and you're stuck there for the length of your term. Right. Whereas if you're in a variable rate, the benefit that you receive is as the Bank of Canada moves up and down, as we fluctuate, it's that fluctuation that you as a consumer in variable get to ride and, and enjoy the benefits. End of the day, variable is not for everybody, but, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. You need to know more right before you can make that final decision. Right? Well, our interest rates going to go the rest of the year. Yeah, interest rates are climbing right now. Interesting. Well, go do you think in June there, the Bank of Canada is going to do another 50, uh, 50 basis point increase, Jeff? I, TIF, uh, Bank of Canada uh, president made it very clear that a 75 basis point increase is not off the table. They're project wow. projecting a uh, 3% increase by next year. Yeah. So, like, perspective, we're at 1% right now. Bank of Canada, one yes. percent. Yes. So if we had a three-quarter point, that puts us at one seventy-five. And like I was saying earlier, net neutral, they're looking to get between two and three percent. So they're they're trying to do it really, really quick. But there's all kinds of other stuff that. You know, what's net neutral? What's net neutral? They should two have three to per, two to three percent. And the 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 meaning of net neutral in their their uh, their sphere is it's not stimulating the economy and it's not hurting the economy. Okay. Right. Right. So if they need to stimulate the economy, we mm -hmm. lower interest rates. If they need to pull the economy back, right, then we increase interest. So right now, inflation, 6.7%, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, for the month of March. And this is why mm -hmm. I said, Curry, I think it'll be eight to nine. But anyways, that's that's another no, I don't. I don't, I don't deny that it was eight. No, no, for sure. Right. But that's, that's kind of where I'd thrown that number out. But anyways, yep. it's one of those that... Uh, um, you know, they're like I was saying, net, just the, the whole net neutral piece and sorry, losing the train of thought there a little yeah. bit. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, if the point's there, right? So, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess the thing is what, 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 what we'll like to do is we'll, we'll like to probably let's, let's wrap it up. I guess this is good. We've yeah. been going for an, hour, great and, an hour and 20 it. minutes. Crushed it. So, like, yeah, we, cr we crushed it. Uh, but we'll talk about the next time. Uh, uh, what we're looking at doing is record going live every Friday on Fridays, uh, the middle of a, uh, of every month. And then at the end of every month, so twice and a month, so, yeah. twice a month. Uh, so we'll be tackling a couple of other episodes. We'll try to get some other guests on. Um, and I got a city we'll inspector also, calling me right now. <laughs> we'll actually talk about, um, the good one or we'll not a good like guy. That. No, we'll it's talk never good about, news, uh, we'll talk about maybe a potential recession and, and we'll have more economic data to talk about that. And then also, We'll go into more deep diving on the differences between variable and fixed and how they're funded out on the, so basically what, what constitutes a variable rate, which is versus what, where do the banks come up with their fixed rates? So Trevor, write that down. We're going to go yep. into more detail about that. And, and I think we should episode. tell our, our listeners or, or, or viewing audience too, if they have topics they want us to do, either hop on yes. live while we're doing it or give it to us ahead of time and we can prepare them because now we've got a, a pretty... Awesome audience. And <laughs> also, to, just to touch on what Curry was saying about you know future topics, take a look at the old catalog. Like we've yeah. we've got a hundred and I think a hundred and thirty, hundred and forty episodes that we've done. You know, moving over to the Dean Blundell Network is just new for us now, but we've been doing this for for four years, four years right? We're starting yeah. year number five, which is yeah, kind of where that whole season thing. Most came from. importantly, if you want to sponsor us, feel free to reach out. We will uh, we will get your names out there. Yeah, hundred percent. We're and talking Ferrari, Lamborghini, Yeti, whatever you got. Bring I'll it. take a free pen at this stage. I, I'm just that. I'm, that, I'm that. You know, that is Yeti, that is static Yeti. to be on this Let's network. So. I'm pretty sure I've got some CR Smith financial ones already. Yeah, I, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. I got a whole. So bunch because of you gave them away, you need them back. 
You want no, C.R. No, Smith got, coming I, we, back, we or you want to those? No, we're fine. Oh, okay. Well, hey, well, I'm well, saying well, like if Ryan and Ryan Johnston, if me. you want to sponsor us, you know, Royal LePage NRC, bring it on. Bring it on. Any up. like a, any of the fun companies that want to sponsor our show, Fidelity, McKenzie, SLGI. I'm just shouting it out there. Why not? Um, but anyway, um, okay. thanks very much, everyone. It's what, the keep that brought it. That's for tax and two. Remember here, Curry. You don't have to introduce us again here. We just end with with. No, Bond. I know. <laughs> yeah, but you got to, Bonda. Where's your microphone? It's right beside my face here. Do you have yeah, any Steve, again? just above his name, again. Josh Bond. There, all there, it's right okay. there. All right. Don't worry. All right, we'll everybody. Get everybody well, set let's... up, tweaked for future. Can you hear me? Because you can listen, and when I've been talking in, no, because it keeps cutting out. Okay. Well, all right. Sounds like you're in Grinwald or whatever the Harry Potter bank. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, thanks to everyone that has uh, positively contributed to the podcast. Um, that is it. Uh, Bondo. Chris? Bondo, so, I mean, sorry, wait. Josh, go ahead first. Help us help you stay informed. And, Melissa, we are going to be on all social media networks and YouTube as well. Spotify, yeah. YouTube. We're not on... ITunes. Not on YouTube for the first one, just because there's uh, some production stuff that goes on in the background. YouTube uh, needs to make sure that we're not uh, um, doing anything unethical, uh, inappropriate, or what have you. We fall into their um, so terms we might of not service. Have Trevor we'll give us a review when they review it. You might not. What's be able that? To... Oh, <laughs> joking. All right, Chris. Thanks thank you. Take us out. I guess. Yeah, bud. I don't know how to... <laughs>